In recent years, more and more Americans have made plain their intention at the time of their death to donate their organs so that others may live longer, healthier lives. The fact is there are already too few organs available for the 50,000 Americans who are now waiting for an organ transplant. Having said that, what you're about to see goes to the heart of a little-known controversy that's been developing in the organ transplant community. Are surgeons taking organs from patients who are not quite dead, and in some cases, giving them drugs that might hasten death? We begin with a case which at the time seemed to be nothing more than an odd medical mishap. One spring night in Defiance, Ohio, an intruder walked into the home of Pamela James, a 33-year-old mother of two, and he fired a small caliber bullet into her brain. Emergency physicians quickly saw Mrs. James as a potential organ donor and sent her to St. Vincent's Medical Center in Toledo, where doctors pronounced her dead. A team of physicians uh, selectively removed one body part after another. Uh, they removed skin, they removed bone, they removed kidneys. Attorney Dave Williams defended the man who admitted shooting Pamela James in 1987. For Williams, it was a routine murder case until one night sifting through the victim's medical records. I was stunned when I read the coroner. The time of death listed by the coroner is virtually to the minute coincidental with the time they removed her heart. Was it possible that Pamela James was still alive when her organs were removed? To help find the answer, Attorney Williams asked Dr. Jan Liestma, a widely respected neuropathologist, to examine the victim's brain. So to me, it looked uh, startlingly normal. So we have a, a lower grade uh, brain injury uh, from which I would expect a person to be able to survive. Williams finally reached a disturbing conclusion. It was the act of organ harvesting that had killed Pamela James, not the bullet. The real problem in this case is that she never got a chance to survive. She was managed for purposes of harvest rather than managed as a neurosurgical patient. Although St. Vincent's Medical Center insisted that James had definitely died before her organs were taken, the prosecutor suddenly dropped aggravated murder charges against the man who shot her, allowing him to plead guilty to a lesser charge. It never would have occurred to me that a person could be not fatally injured and still end up on an uh, operating table for the purpose of having their organs harvested. With each passing year, as more people die waiting for organs, we have found that transplant doctors have begun aggressively to take organs in ways that some distinguished doctors and ethicists say is highly improper and possibly illegal. But none of this might have come to light had it not been for Peggy Record Bargholt. Fourteen years ago, she donated the organs of her three-year-old son, Jeffrey, who had died of a brain hemorrhage. Jeffrey's kidneys, one went to a 12-year-old, the other to a 19-year-old. His liver was transplanted into a, a comatose two-and-a-half-year-old child in Pittsburgh, and his corneas went to two adult males, and one of them had never seen his children before. The experience changed Peggy's life in more ways than one. Soon, she began working at LifeBank, an organ procurement agency in Cleveland. Her mission? To convince more people to donate organs. But while there, she made a shocking discovery, one that would disturb some leading medical ethicists and spawn at least one criminal investigation. Peggy had found that one Cleveland hospital was planning a protocol, a blueprint, to get organs in a very unusual way. Instead of taking organs from patients who were brain dead, as is customary, Doctors were now willing to take organs from donors with severe brain damage from, say, a bullet wound. I became aware that they were looking at patients who were neurologically impaired. But not brain dead. Correct. Because these seriously injured patients are not yet brain dead, doctors would have to use an older, less precise method of declaring death, the absence of a heartbeat. And that concerns Dr. Norman is a prominent researcher who has studied this method of declaring death. One of the things that my group has shown is that that is a much more complex and difficult state to diagnose. That you can be wrong, that you can think the heart has stopped and it hasn't. And because organs deteriorate without oxygen, 
There is a premium on declaring death as quickly as possible. Some doctors say too quickly. Under this protocol, with the consent of the family, life support would be withdrawn and a doctor not affiliated with the transplant team would declare death after just two minutes without a heartbeat. You are on very thin legal ice. You are at risk of being seen as someone who prematurely took organs. Arthur Kaplan, one of the nation's leading medical ethicists, says no one knows for sure how soon death occurs after the heart stops. If you have a heart that might resuscitate, if you have something that might start working again, even if it's stopped, even if it's not working right now, you don't want to say that someone is dead. What most disturbed Peggy Bargold was not just that a hospital might take organs from patients who are not dead. She also discovered that the hospital planned to give patients who were still alive massive doses of potentially harmful drugs solely to make their organs healthier for transplant. Mrs. Barco took her concerns about this protocol to Professor Mary Ellen Waite, who directs the bioethics program at Cleveland State University. We investigated four months, and the response to everyone that I consulted with was, what are they trying to do, kill them? And after you get three or well, four that's of the those... Question, that's the question that, you, that I, has to occur to you if you read about this. Yes. Well, after three or four people who knew better than I asked me, what are they trying to do, kill them? I thought, <laughs> if they are, we need to get the authorities involved. The issue to us was really unique. We, no one in our office had ever heard of this. Carmen Marino, an assistant county prosecutor in Cleveland, investigated Barco's discovery, and he was surprised to learn who was involved. Well, the hospital in question, I know, is the Cleveland Clinic, right? Yes. And this is a world-renowned institution that has done so much good for so many people down the years. Yeah, they have a tremendous history. They are an excellent medical right. institution. As part of his investigation, Mr. Marino reviewed this videotape of a Cleveland Clinic doctor explaining to staff that patients previously unsuitable for organ donations could now be donors minutes after their hearts stop. We don't want to sabotage people's belief in organ donation and, and also your comfort with the concept of brain death. We're not trying to say that these people are brain dead at all. They're not dead yet. What Prosecutor Marino wanted to know, however, is whether clinic doctors might hasten the donor's death by administering a large dose of a drug called Regitine. That drug, when given just as life support is withdrawn, helps to keep organs healthy. But Regitine also does something else. It blocks the body's automatic release of adrenaline, which in critically injured patients helps the body to fight off death. Patients who have been injured maintain themselves using adrenaline. That is vital for their attempt to maintain life. So if regitine is then injected, that fights, blocks the adrenaline? Well, actually, this is not good for the patient. It is good for the organs. 